So today what I am going to, would like to talk about is um, uh, some issues related to scores and rankings. Again, we have several, uh, in, uh, on the assignments you've had, sometimes I've asked you to rank um, countries by social welfare, okay? I'm asking you maybe to rank restaurants by quality. That's kind of one of the things that you would like to do here. And my claim is that this is a common thing to want to do. Um, actually, everybody can hear through this microphone, right? It's through the microphone, right? Okay, good. Um, the, so my claim is that it's a common thing to want to do to um, have, look at data and come up with some kind of a function that measures, that reduces your data set to some kind of a measure of merit to highlight some property of what you're interested in, okay? Every one of you guys has come to, um, you know, uh, is familiar with rankings, published rankings of things. Why did you guys come to Stony Brook, most likely? There's a couple of different reasons, but it would not shock me if the reason you came to Stony Brook was you got rejected by higher-ranked universities <laughs> and you got accepted by us. Okay, and um, that a lot of the decision of um, these things are that, uh, you know, you, you've seen these published rankings of universities, okay? You know, in the United States, U.S. News is a big thing. Um, there's other, a variety of other rankings of universities put out by different organizations. Okay, if you're a sports person, you're used to rankings of who's the best tennis players. If you follow tennis, there's a tennis ranking. And... People worry much, you know, about, oh, I, I'm, I'm now ranked seventh among tennis players. Um, there's, um, I even found one, here's a ranking among law firms, okay, which is which claims to be the best law firm. And if you look carefully, you'll see Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe um, as one of the, uh, that, that's a joke, okay, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, okay. Um, the law firms are usually named after people, okay. Um, anyway, bottom line is, it should be clear that there's a common problem of analyze data and pick out a ranking of things. Any questions about that? And I wanted to say that there's two problems that are essentially the same. One is developing a score function, scoring function that, high, that reduces your multidimensional data to a particular single value, okay? And rankings, which are usually saying who's first, second, third, or fourth. If you have a function that scores by merit, then you can sort them, and their position in the sorted order defines the ranking. Does everybody see that? And if you have a ranking and you're determined to come up with a scoring order of merit, well, just take their ranking number as that number, right? So these two problems are essentially the same up to sorting. Any questions? Okay. So the... Score, rank, scoring function problem that you guys are probably most familiar with has to do with assigning grades, okay? And that all of you have been through the educational system. You have had um, dozens of classes. Each, class, each person who's teaching the class has a slightly different grading system, right? They will have a different weight depending upon, someone will have a different weight depending upon how much they count homeworks to, to exams. Some might say, I'll drop the, low, the, the, the lowest quiz grade, okay? Some might permit extra credit on some other variable or something like this. Okay, some may weigh attendance, some may not, okay? I think that thinking about grades as sort of a scoring function is useful because it highlights, in my mind, three kind of important properties of, of scoring functions. One is that it is a very arbitrary thing. Every teacher uses a professor in this university uses a different scoring function to weight their students. And every professor is certain that they do it the right way. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. Another property of the grading system is that there is no way to check in general whether we are doing it a right thing. I have decided you are an 88.5 student in my class. Okay. Are you, well, I don't know if that's good or bad, okay? It, you know, it doesn't, you know, in my scoring system. But there's no clear that there is a right, there's not clear that there is a right answer here, right? Does everybody kind of get this idea, okay? 
There's different things you would do if you knew that there was a right answer. Yes. Right, right, right. If he came in, if ever, all of you came in at the beginning of the semester wearing a shirt with a number on it that said what your score was, okay, or let's say even half of you did, okay, I could probably come up with a scoring function that did a good job matching what those people's right number was, okay, and then use it on the rest of you guys with some level of confidence. But in general, there is not a right answer here. There is no validation. There is no gold standard. Does everybody see that? OK, that was true with restaurant reviews. That's true with the students in my class. That's true with tennis players. That's true with everything. OK, any questions? The third thing, though, so this looks like trouble. Point two looks like trouble. The third observation is, that despite the fact that all the professors are doing something different, and despite the fact that it's completely unvalidated, grades tend to correlate strongly between classes. Okay? That if I take a look at all of you guys, all of you guys were most likely pretty consistent in all your classes. It's not the case if you had a B average. Was your B average because 80% of the time you got Bs, 10% of the time you got A's, and 10% of the times you got C's? Or was it because you got A's 50% of the time and C's 50% of the time? Generally speaking, for most people over all this thing, grades are astonishingly consistent across, you know, you, know, you have certain subjects you like better or worse or stuff like that. that you, but I think people will agree that there is general consistency across, uh, across courses even though people do these things completely different, okay? And this is, to my mind, a sign that if you do a reasonable scoring function, it's likely to turn out okay. In my class, we have the right scoring function. Other people's professors don't have quite the right scoring function. But nonetheless, the A stu students I give A's to tend to be the students that those stu they give A's to, okay? So we're probably somehow still measuring the same basic thing. Any questions about it? So I kind of, you know, th this to my mind, if you think about it this way, it frames a lot of the thinking one should have about scores, OK? And again, sometimes in the, when, when, you know, when you hear about scoring functions, it doesn't sound very scientific. Some people will call a scoring function a statistic. Now, something, calling something a statistic, I think, makes it sound better, OK? Any question? But it's again, we're collapsing a bunch of numbers into one number. We're going to call that a statistic or a score. Any questions? OK, good. And the thing that I want to uh, make clear again, later on in the semester, we're going to be learning about linear regression. We're going to learn about ways to take data where we've got feature data, we've got values that we know that we want the values to fit, OK? And um, we want to design a function that will, for similar records to what we get, produce scores similar to what we've seen. That is a regression problem, right? We've seen this where we have points. We fit them to a line or a curve. And this is something we can do if we have training data where we have know what the right answer is, OK? Where we know what the grade that I should have given you is, OK? If we're in that situation, that's great. We should behave like we're going to behave in later chapters of the book. But often, we are not in that situation. Any questions about it? And in a lot of ranking problems, you do have data that you can work on. Google ranking, you know, ranking, pay, you know, ranking hits to a, um, you know, Google, what does Google do? You type in a web query, it, it ranks all the documents in the world based on how appropriate they are for your query, right? They're going to compute some kind of a function on each document to get a score. How good is it like your query? OK. How do they have actual data to train on to tell whether they've got the right answer? Well, they've got some because when you click on a web, you know, typically you show 10, um, what you call it? You, you, you show the, the top 10 hits for a document. If everybody clicks, if, if I click on number four, the fourth ranked thing, 
if Google was trying to present them in order from most, most appropriate to worst, me clicking on the fourth page and the fourth item is a vote against the rankings for the top three. Does everybody see that? So Google's got zillions of, of data points to help give some idea of whether one thing ranks better than another, right? And so Google doesn't just sort of come up with a seat of its pants function. They do have some ground truth for it. But in general, you don't have a ground truth. Any questions about that? OK, good. So let me talk about a scoring function or a statistic that is, in my mind, a good, st a, a good, thing to, a, a good scoring function. OK? How many people here have heard of body mass index, BMI? OK, everybody's heard about it. So what is BMI? It is a statistic that someone constructed that was supposed to try to encapsulate how, what is, you know, are you overweight or underweight, OK? And someone noticed that um, mass, how, just how much you weigh, isn't an appropriate thing. Because if you're very, very tall, OK, you should weigh more than somebody who's short, OK? Instead, ma BMI is something that is mass divided by the height squared, OK? And in this case, they measure uh, mass in kilograms and height in meters, OK? And as, again, you guys know about um, BMI. What's kind of neat about it is that these numbers are relatively, are, are highly interpretable. As the United States government, I guess, says, being underweight is below 18.5 on this. But normal weight is from 18.5 to 25. Overweight is 25 to 30, and obese is over 30. OK? Any questions about that? So now, what is nice about the BMI? OK? In my mind, what makes this a great scoring function? Well, for one thing, it's very interpretable. OK? I don't know if you guys, how many, how many of you guys knew your BMI before here? You may be at an age where this is no longer, not really an issue. But I know my BMI, OK? Uh, in fact, now you know my BMI. I'm a 22.8, which means I'm OK, but I could probably do, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm distressingly close to the upper bound, OK? Any questions about that? So it's a very interpretable number. This is good, OK? Um, and, you know, actually, one thing to did anyone hear about Donald Trump and his BMI lately? OK? Donald Trump, who has been claiming he's the healthiest man in the universe, OK? Um, he went on a TV show and announced what his weight was. And um, he had been published before as being six feet two inches. And he announced his weight. And when they computed his BMI, he was obese. <laughs> but um, then they announced that he's really an inch taller. So somehow at age 70, he has grown an inch, OK? And that was enough to knock him down into the overweight class. Any questions about it, OK? So BMI, I think, is a very good score. It's not a perfect score. But generally speaking, this is a statistic which, it turns out, correlates with a lot of health outcomes, OK? And you know, it wasn't derived from any obvious machine learning -y algorithm. It's a statistic that's, that, that, that someone der derived with, looked at some data sets, said, yeah, it seems to do a pretty good job kind of with that. And that's the what BMI is. Any questions? OK, so I consider BMI a good thing. It's not a perfect statistic. But there's all kinds of interesting things you can do with it. So here, I took a look at professional basketball players and professional US football players. OK? And we can imagine every person, this is a dot plot. OK, we have every person has a height and a weight. OK? And they define one point here. And we can color the point depending upon what their uh, category is, OK, based on according to the BMI categories. Are you normal weight, ob overweight, or obese? Which of these do we think is the basketball players? If you, even if you can't read it there, OK? This group is, looks like half normal weight, half overweight. This group says almost half obese, very few normal weight, the rest overweight. Which do we think, I mean, which, one, which looks like NBA basketball players? The first one are the NBA basketball players, right? 
These are the real animals that you have on the, in the NFL, right? Okay? And these guys, just because of the nature of the sport, you know, half the player's job is to sit there and stop other people from, from moving, okay? And being very heavy helps to that, okay? Any questions? And, you know, you can do similar breakdowns if you color by a similar space by position. You look at, at people's height and, height and weight space based on what position they play. You see interesting patterns and stuff like that. Okay, any questions? Okay, yeah. Well, the better your BMI, the better will your health. But I think what, you know, better, recognize that uh, better, this is not a uh, monotonic thing. Better in BMI is not a monotonic thing. Health, if we reflect health as being how long you live, then living longer is better, right? In BMI, there is not um, a statistic here that is that goes in one way. If your BMI is too high, okay, you're obese and that's bad. If your BMI is too low, you are, you know, anorexic and dying, okay? So recognize that, that, that we would expect BMI properly interpreted to correlate with health outcomes. Okay. What? What was done, to be honest with you, the way BMI was designed, as I said here, was that um, it was actually designed to correlate with body fat percentage. So somebody, what somebody did is, you know, there are ways to measure body fat percentage by using calipers and throwing somebody in water and seeing how they, you know, a, a degree of buoyancy and things like that. But it's hard to measure body fat percentage accurately. So what they found, though, was that, that this statistic correlated reasonably well with body fat percentage and was a lot easier to measure. That's actually the history of BMI as a measurement. Okay, yeah. So the claim is that if you have two people who have the same weight and the same height, they should have the same body fat percentage. Now that's not completely true. You could imagine one person who has stu studiously locked themselves in a chair and hasn't moved a muscle, okay? And they probably have a higher, you know, can achieve the same weight as, you know, the, 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 the athletes who's, who's got, got all muscle and no fat. But bottom line, this is a something that, generally speaking, seems to correlate reasonably well with that and stands in as a reasonably good measure of it. It's not perfect, but it's a relatively simple statistic to compute that seems to capture a lot of what is going on. Okay? Any questions about it? So that's why BMI is a good thing. Does that mean that there's not a better thing? If you read the literature, you'll find lots of people complaining BMI isn't the right statistic. There's a more complicated statistic that will do better. But BMI, to my mind, has been a useful thing, okay? And I think I would be very happy if my score, any score I developed, was as popular as BMI. Any questions? Okay, good. So what I, what I wanted to clarify, any other questions about BMI? So when we think about scores, I still want to say that I want to distinguish between two kinds of things, because you do want to, inherently here, we're going to want to regress against things. We want there to be a target for what our function is supposed to be. Um, and you could imagine a gold standard is what we I, I normally think of as being one where there are labels that are correct for what the answer should be. Okay. There's a related concept that we should think about called proxies, which are variables we can measure that probably correlate with the thing that we really care about, right? If I'm trying to come up with a grading function to evaluate the students in my class, okay, I would love it if I really knew how good every student was so I could fit and define what the right, or at least a bunch of students, so I could fit and define the right grading function. Now, typically, there is not a correct set labeling there, so there's not a gold standard. Usually, you, it's, however, there are proxies, things that we think would be correlated with grades, okay, with, with, with what you want, that you could try to fit your statistic to, okay? 
So suppose I wanted to define a what is the best grade um, function for me to assign in how to weigh my homeworks and exams. One thing I could do is get all of your GRE scores, okay, and say, do we believe that GRE scores correlate with what grades you should get? Yeah, why not? Okay, it kind of does, right? And I could conceivably try to train, use my, um, what you call it, try to come up with a grade function that will predict your GRE scores, okay? And then use that to assess class performance, okay? How many people like that idea? A few. How many people don't like that idea? Okay, why don't you like it? So what you're saying is that there is a, that, that 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 SAT or GRE doesn't correl it correlates with it, but it doesn't predict it that well, okay? And so kind of this is the kind of tension that we often have in here, okay? We could try to come up with often you can come up and and find a proxy for what you want to measure, and then pretend you're a scientist and and do a regression against it, okay? The alternative is you try to come up with a scoring system. If you don't have a real gold standard for measuring what you really measure, okay, then you know maybe you're better off with a score that captures some kind of an intuition rather than fitting to a wrong thing. It, 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 be aware that there is this difference between something that sort of correlates with it and what you really want to measure, okay? And at you know when you're trying to build some kind of a system to make predictions. Do you try to predict scientifically to the almost right thing, or do you use your judgment and maybe use the proxy just to evaluate how well it is? Any questions about that? Yeah. So we are using like software simultaneously in two kinds of things. One is like we are trying to say we can predict all the proxy and we can use proxy as a test, right? That's what that's what you're saying. Like we use a both the unit or this is just one. Well, there's two different ways you could do it. Okay. Again, I proxy. In principle, for any quantity you care about, either you have an accurate measurement of it or you don't. If you don't have an accurate measure of it, you may very well have a measurement, an accurate measurement of something that sort of correlates with it. That much is kind of what I'm saying. And the question then is you have to decide what you want to do with it. Okay? If you believe that this proxy is really a great match for what you're really trying to measure, then it kind of makes sense to try to machine learning and, 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 and fit to it. If not, probably it pays to use some kind of a scoring system based on general judgment. And then maybe look and see what your, you know, use the proxy sort of for evaluation to see how good does it do and where are the anomalies and does it make sense. And I look at this and I try to predict how good a grade somebody should get. I'd say, Oh, look, here's somebody who I thought was going to get a good score in my class, but um, they, their SAT score was bad, and it turns out to be him who refused to do the English part of his SAT. Okay? So, anyway, just recognize that there's this difference, okay? I'm not giving you a right answer here. Any question about it? Yeah. So the question, if you don't have a, a um, again, if you have a, this is basically saying just what I said before. If you have a gold standard, you can train a regression function. If all you have are proxies, basically all you, I think that it's really at this point, all you should probably try to do is to train your scoring function. Uh, you can evaluate your scoring function. And typically what you will find is that there are certain people who do badly by your proxy, okay? You, your, 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 you know the, uh, you know according to this proxy, they look like they should be bad. According to your measure, it looks like they're good. These are probably people you would want to investigate to see whether you, you know, what, you know, t why, why, why there is this difference. Okay, so sometimes I say you use it for evaluation instead of for training. Any questions? Okay. There's a book that just came out that's a very interesting book called Weapons of Math Destruction. 
I don't know if anybody, has anybody heard of this book? This just came out like a, a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's written by a data scientist who was trying to complain about the bad effects of a lot of the models people build, a lot of the big data models people build. Because people will often confuse proxies for gold standards. They'll build a scoring system that will, um, what you call it, will seemingly reflect something related to what they are doing and then over-interpret this to make big decisions. So one example that uh, they talk about in there that's kind of relevant to here on Long Island has to do with trying to predict whether or not teachers are good. You know, in the grade schools, there's a lot of people who get angry. Oh, if we have too many bad teachers. Let's fire the bad teachers. And there's a question of how do you measure if a teacher is bad, OK? And you know, if you trust the principal, the principal might talk to people and might have an understanding of who's good or bad. But if you want a quantitative way of doing it, you know, people say, no, I want a quantitative thing. I want them to improve test scores. So there's been a movement here where they give students tests every year. And they see whether or not the students in your class did better or worse than they did the previous year, right? If I take a look at a student who's, uh, you know, or how much better they're doing this year. If I take the average of the students in my class compared to the average of how they did last year, if I'm a good teacher, that should go up, okay? But this is, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons, yeah. Okay, the, 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 the case for these things, again, you have to read these things and be careful. It, th th it's quite convincing that, that a lot of teachers have been evaluated under this measure, under very, very noisy measurements, okay? And, but once you compute a function that says, supposedly correlates good teacher, bad teacher, it's easy to fire the people that do lowest by the score, okay? And if you're training it against some kind of a proxy, okay, of whether they improve scores rather than whether or not they, um, what you call it, how well they're teaching, you can get into bad decisions, okay? And that's kind of, I guess, the point. Read the book. The book is actually quite convincing in many ways. Any questions? Okay, fair enough. Okay, so what is... When is it appropriate to use, present, let's say, a score or a ranking? When, when, when are rankings more, better or worse than presenting scores? Okay? And the way I would say is you want to think about, they, they, they encode in some sense the same information, but they're often different than how they're interpretable. So the first question is, are your numbers presented in isolation? So which is a better measure? Stony Brook's basketball team at one point in the distant past ranked 111th out of 351 teams, okay? But according to a score called RPI, its score, RPI score was 39.18. Which one tells you more about how good or bad Stony Brook's team was? The ranking is easier to put in context, right? If I know, you know, I know Stony Brook, especially if I know the number of teams, yeah. Okay, suppose I tell you that, that Stony Brook's RPI is 39.8, and what's the second piece of information you want? The best team had a rank an RPI of 17.2. Now, how good is Stony Brook? Well, it tells me, but it doesn't tell me very, very much. I don't know anything about the units that this is measured in. I claim that even with that second piece of information, I claim that, uh, that, that uh, the, the rank here, the, the rank and this is more informative than the, the, the best or worst rank and this one. Okay? Okay, so now the you're getting at the second question, okay? 
What if we cared about, wanted to know about the distribution of scores? Suppose we wanted to know how much better the first team is than the second team, okay? Are they almost as good as each other? Or are they, um, is one wildly better? Which would be more informative, knowing who's first and second or knowing their RPI scores? There the scores would make a difference, right? So it's not like one is always better than the other. I claim that as in isolation, ranks are tend to be better, more interpretable, okay? Um, and uh, in terms of understanding the distribution, the scores are probably more meaningful, okay? Another question is whether you're concerned about analog comparing teams in the middle of the distribution or if you're comparing teams at the ends of the distribution, okay? So... Notice that when you're talking about ranks, if we have a score, let's say I wanted to take a look at you guys. I take the people in the class and I sort you by height. One of you guys is the tallest and one of you guys is the second tallest, okay? And there's probably a non-trivial difference there. If I look in the middle, I compare the height of the 25th and the 26th person in the class. How will the size of that difference be compared to the first or the second? Does everybody agree that if we've got it drawing from a bell-shaped curve, the difference between things in the middle is relatively small? If we assume that our scoring function has a certain amount of noise or slop or ambiguity or doesn't quite perfectly measure what we want, small differences in the score function can yield a big difference in the ranking function. Does everybody see that? If you're right at the middle of the distribution, a slightly higher score suddenly moves you many, many places ahead in the total order, okay? So if you care about who's at the top and who's at the very bottom, rankings are good. If you care about, you know, what's going on in the middle of the distribution, scores are probably more, more descriptive. Any questions? Okay, that I think everybody's clear from. So what are the properties of good scoring functions in my mind? Well, one you would like is that they should be easily computable. BMI was great because you could compute it on a calculator and we could figure out what happened when Donald Trump loses that inch that uh, he suddenly gained, okay? Um, they they, they, they ha are on some kind of a measure where the numbers are understandable. The fact that there was a natural scale, this 25 thing is somehow satisfying as the threshold between too big and, too, and, and just right. They are, in my mind, based on a monotonic interpretation of variables. What do I mean by this? If, let's say, I wanted to score you guys based on your grades, okay, on every particular assignment, a higher score is better than a lower score. Does everybody see that? Suppose on the exam I put it down as points taken off your exam. A lower score would then be better than a bigger score. If you're trying to combine a bunch of these variables to produce a order of metric, if each of your metrics has an interpretation that correlates in a, in, a lot, in, a, in a direct sense with what your desired outcome is, then any linear combination of that should capture what you're trying to do. Something like BMI, remember in health, this was not true, right? Because the healthiest part was in the middle, okay? Generally speaking, it would, you would like it to be based on variables, okay, that have a, a monotonic interpretation correlating with what you want to do. Any questions? Yeah. So when you say it should be easily computable and easily understandable, does it mean that when we are making a scoring function, we should take as the less number of features? Uh, it might, what, should it have less number of features or more features? I would say, generally speaking, if you really don't know what you're trying to measure against, okay, you're trying to predict who's a good teacher, okay, are you better off take measuring 100 properties of teachers, some of which weakly correlate with what you're doing, and combine them? Let's say a taller teacher is probably better than a shorter teacher because you can see over the lectern better, right? Or a louder teacher is probably better than... Are you, is it good to combine all these things? Or would you get a more meaningful statistic from finding a small number of things you really understood and 
Let them drive what you're, you're building your statistic on. Generally speaking, I would say a small number of things you understand will probably produce a more meaningful thing than throwing in a lot of things you don't understand. Okay? So there's a sort of Occam's razor, understand this kind of thing that I would expect. So if I were building a scoring function, I would want it to be based on things I understood. Okay? And not just, you know, not weak correlations and things like that, unless I dealt with them properly. It would be the case that if I had outliers, okay, people who I knew were, if I had a list of teachers who were fired in the past several years, I'd like it to, that, that when I texted that the students that we, teachers we fired in the past scored badly by this measure, okay? If I don't, usually you have some kind of a notion of what kind of people are likely the best and what kind of, pe what kind of things are likely the best and what things are likely the worst, you would like your score, prove that your scoring function does sensible things like that, right? If, you know, if you, d you did an analysis of who was the most important person in the world and it came out it was me, that would be a problem, right? It's not that, oh, I figured out something that, th that, that wasn't clear. It, that's a problem, right? And there's certain things that you should be able to know about. The other thing that I would say is, we'll talk about z-scores in a second. It should probably be built from normalized variables rather than raw counts that are over a big range, okay? So several times here I've mentioned this idea of z-scores. Z-scores are a way to take a column of numbers, a particular feature, and normalize it so that it has basically a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, okay? So z-scores are a linear transformation. If we have a bunch of variables, a variable x, where there's a lot of different var values, let's say there's n values, x1, x2, dot, 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 up to xn, the z-score of the ith value of x is going to be x minus the mean of x divided by the standard deviation of x, okay? And what does this mean? This means that if x sub i is at the mean in the middle, it's going to be zero. The z-score is going to be zero. Does everybody see that? If x, if, the, if all these numbers are big, it's going to mean the mean is going to be big. And subtracting it from the mean, negative numbers mean less than the mean, positive numbers mean greater than the mean. Any questions about that? And by normalizing it by the standard deviation, if these numbers bump around a lot, it kind of shrinks it down again. So the mean is 1 and the standard deviation is 1. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so what's true here is, if I take the z-score of something, in principle, the mean of my number is going to be 0. The standard deviation of this thing is going to be 1. The range between the highest value and the lowest observed value is variable, okay? You can have two different distributions whose mean is 0 and standard deviation is 1. Does everybody see that? So the ranges of the observed values are not the same. You could say, why don't I normalize it so they're all between 0 and 1? Okay? This is kind of a, you know, a more set. A, so, so you could imagine another normalization where you just take the, subtract every number from the min and divide it by the max. And now it's bet also between 0 and 1. But you don't get any promises about what sigma is, and you don't get any problems, promises about what the mean is. Okay? So these scores tend to be a good way to, a better way to normalize it. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to argue why, but these scores tend to be a good thing. Okay? In fact, if the data is normally distributed, okay, it, 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 it does the right thing. The other, I guess the other reason why your normalization scheme is not as good 
is one outlier dramatically changes the entire normalization range. Does everybody see that? And this is less likely to kind of do that. Okay, if we think about what would happen if we did everybody by wealth, Bill Gates, if we normalize it by your notion, Bill Gates is going to be one, and everybody else is going to be zero, right? Yeah. And this is everybody else in the, in the planet, okay? And the mean is going to be close to zero. And the standard deviation is, well, this thing, well, is going to be probably pretty small, because there's only one point that's out of it, right? Instead of by z-scores, what would I do? I would have a, uh, the mean would be here. It's a little shifted because Bill Gates is here. The z-score of Bill Gates is going to be extremely high, but the rest of them are kind of behaved relatively sensibly. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So by calculating the scoring function, how do you like, okay. simply add the z-scores and the Generally speaking, the mean of all of the, each z-score variable is going to be 1. The expected value of each variable is 1, is, is 0. Adding them up is then a relatively sensible thing to do. The range should, uh, again, if you have a normal distribution or something like that, the value should be quite comparable. Okay. And so bottom line, z-scores are generally a good thing to do, okay? In fact, the property that I guess I would say that's interesting is that the z-score in inches is the same as the z-score measured in miles, the height measured in miles. That's one interesting property here, right? If you compute these things, okay, as far as whether you're scaling them, measuring my height in miles, I would get a very, very small number. Measuring my height in inches, you get a pretty big number. Right? If you take the z-score of a bunch of numbers, the z-scores of the heights will be the same as the z in, in inches are the same as the z-score in miles. Any questions? Yes? So when we plot the variables x and y and we plot their z-scores yeah. and change the, so that changes the scale, uh, how, should, how different should the scales be? Like if one variable is from minus 2 to 2, is it okay if the other variable is Yeah, minus 2 to 2 versus minus 10 to 10 doesn't scare me so much. Okay? Even Bill Gates, where everybody, most people are right, but Bill Gates is off the chart, okay, doesn't really scare me so much, okay, because most people are kind of right. Bottom line is, the basic magnitude of these scores are basically comparable, okay? Yeah. So what I would say is that if you're dealing with things of wildly different scale, okay, z-scores are generally a good thing. For wealth here, which was power law distributed, I would have probably hit people with a log first, and then maybe take the z-score of the logs, okay? But generally speaking, for a lot of things, if you're combining a lot of variables that are over a big range, okay, taking z-scores is a good thing, okay? If they're over a relatively comparable range, it's maybe it's not so important. Okay? Any questions about it? So yeah. Uh, like you talked about Bill Gates. So Bill Gates is like a, uh, le like a, it is a legitimate case. Like it is for real. It's not. It's right, not right, right. So can we remove, should we remove such cases or okay. keep them? Okay. Generally speaking, the, what I would say is that, that if you have something that is not a bell shaped curve, you probably want to do something to it, like hit it with a log. The problem with bill income was that it's a power law. We'll talk about distributions in a few classes. But, but income was power law distributed. And that's why Bill Gates was an outlier. The purpose of these scores is to bring things into a, so the different variables kind of are more comparable. OK? That's kind of, I guess, the main reason why. You know, it depends what you're doing. I don't want to give you, with all of these things, there's a judgment call. No data scientist is an algorithm that says this is the right way to do these things. But you should recognize that when you've got data that has a lot of outliers, you've got some decisions to make, right? You shouldn't blindly just sort of compute this thing and expect everything to magically work out. You should be thinking about these things. 
Maybe you should delete it. Maybe you should hit it with a log. Okay? You think about it. Okay? Any questions? Good. Yeah. Yeah. So what would I have done with per GDP per capita? Is this GDP per capita or GDP for the whole country? Per capita. Per capita. Okay. A, I would be asking myself, what does the distribution look like? Okay. If GDP per capita, if you look, this is the frequency, and if you did a histogram of it, if it looked something like this, then that would say, this is a bell-shaped curve. A z-score uh, a, a of this thing will bring it down to a nice normal range. If, on the other hand, I saw something that looked like this, I would say that is a power law, okay? That is something that isn't, or not, maybe not a power law, it's... It's not a normally shaped thing, or maybe it's more likely it's probably something that looked like this. Possibly taking the log of this variable. Now it's going to start to look more bell-like. Okay? So the sin that I would be looking at is what is the shape of the distribution? Notice that if you've got a real outlier and you're going to be treating these things, you're going to do multiplication and linear weights of these things. Notice that if Bill Gates is in there, with his in wealth compared to everybody else, there is no coefficient you can use to use, it, um, what you call it, income as something without either making Bill Gates unbelievably big or having very little in value on income at all. Does everybody see that? If I was trying to predict how much education somebody had, okay? If I'm using income and Bill Gates is in there, well, then our model is if it's linearly weighting some income divided by a constant, okay, either it's going to contribute a tiny few minutes of education to every uh, income will can only contribute a small amount to, to know everybody if it's going to get Bill Gates up to 19 years, or Bill Gates, you know, if income's going to have an effect of a couple of years on the education somebody's going to have then that's going to give Bill Gates a zillion-year education. Does everybody see that? And the only way that you can do it is by properly normalizing, which in that case meant taking a log, okay, or something like a log, something sublinear, okay, and to recognize that it was not a linear relationship there. Any questions? Yes? Even if you're taking the log, what if you get a similar score? Well... You can, you know, maybe you take a log again, or you see what, I, hopefully it's gotten better, okay? You, maybe you take the log of the log if it's some unbelievably fast-growing function. But again, you, th what is the principle? The principle is that if you're going to be using it as a feature and you don't want it to dominate it, you can't have huge outliers, okay? Maybe you eliminate them. Maybe you do something, okay? Any questions? Okay, good. Any other questions about z-scores? Okay. So z-scores are a sensible way to combine bell-shaped you know, you know, bell variables of different magnitudes. Any questions? Okay, good. Okay, what I was hoping to do, and I'm still hoping to cover a little bit here, um, any questions about the ranking stuff we've done so far? All of this should be fairly basic and, you know, but, and, and kind of make sense of what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Between yeah. Could we be using Z score or the normal values without any normalization? Okay. So now recognize that a Z score is a linear mapping of things. What is what is Z score doing? The Z score here is taking our value, subtracting the mean, which is just shifting it, right? And it's subtracting a constant from everything. And it's dividing it by something to make it smaller, right? Now, if you're doing a linear regression, is linear, a linear regression powerful enough if you have, a, let's say, allow a constant feature? 
it will be powerful enough to subtract off a constant from essentially a variable. Okay? It is powerful enough to divide, I mean, in setting a coefficient, it is going to multiply if it had a, if you took the z-score of it and the coefficient was c, if we didn't divide the number by sigma, the coefficient would be sigma times c. Z-scores doesn't give you any new power in some sense for linear regression. That linear regression couldn't, in principle, figure out itself. How many of you understand what I'm saying here? Right, 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 right. Linear regression is measuring something about I'm picking through a line, I'm multiplying it by a constant. Sigma is a constant, okay? So in principle, z-scores don't do anything magical for linear regression. They do something magical for your ability to co combine things in a relatively reasonable way and look at variables and see how much they are altering, okay? They're not magical, but they kind of bring things down to a comparable thing, an interpretable thing. Okay? Any questions? Okay, well, maybe we'll talk more about that when we get to linear regression. Any questions? Like what we have said for the linear regression, that the, the relation between them is not going to change, right? Yes. So what, what it amounts to is that in principle, in theory, z-scores don't do anything for you for linear regression. Okay? It turns out that having, for numerical stability reasons, you would like the variables to be about the same range. Okay? And so on that level, it does something. But in theory about, you know, if you picture linear regression as a computation that's being done to optimality and everything perfect in theory, on that level, it doesn't matter whether you took the z-score or not, because it's just another linear transformation of each variable. Okay? It's a good measure for combining variables so that they are on equal scales for the interpretability of a score. Okay? If I tell me that your score back in India, okay, was a 96, was a 200.3, okay, I don't know what score you get on the All India exam, but if I knew the Z score, I'd know were you above average, were you below average? How far uh, above off the charts were you or were you not? The z-score kind of captures that, all that information in it, right? It tells me whether you're above average or below average and by kind of how far relative to everybody else. So that's why it kind of encodes information. It, it's an interpretable number, a more interpretable number by itself than the original value. Yes? It's good for bucketization. What do you mean by for bucketing? Right. So if everything is bell shaped, the other thing is that if you if it was coming from a bill a, a um, normal distribution, you know something about how unusual a z score is, because you know what's the probability of lying k sigma from the mean, right? So if the numbers were normally distributed, when you compute the z-score, you get a sense as to how unusual a thing it was, okay? And that's, that's a more useful descriptor than a number just in isolation. Does that make sense? And again, if your numbers are not normally distributed, well, that's a sign maybe that you should do something to try to make them more normally distributed. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. It would change its mean and also its sigma. Yeah. And then after you take the z score. You take the z score of the log. Final number and the initial quantity. Will they have like? Will they will represent? There's no relationship that's obvious between. I mean, you know, there's there's some relationship, but the guarantee. If you take the logs of the values and compute the z scores, the the mean of these z scores will be zero. The standard deviation will be one regardless of what the original standard deviation and mean was of the values that you had. So like the unscored mean, which, which we get, like is it a real representative of the original quantity we had? Like 
It's a representative of where you stack up compared to your peers in the quantity that you have. Okay? Yeah, it's different, okay? T saying that Bill, that Bill Gates is, you know, five logs more wealth than me is a measure of, it doesn't take anything away from Bill Gates to say that, okay? He's every bit as rich as he was before, but it captures it in a different scale, okay? A nonlinear scale. Any questions? For yeah. Example, if we have a scenario like if we take GDP and all, like USA had that number like per capita also, it was yeah. way off as compared to other countries. Right. So even if you were taking the least, there was a mean, most of the countries, they would turn out to be negative, right? Right. So if you took the, the question, if you, if you took the z-score of a variable that was not normally distributed, one value is going to be very big, and everybody else is going to be negative, okay? And that's, you know, the problem was z-scores are best suited for things that are normally distributed, bell-shaped distributions, okay? And we'll talk more about distributions, but it might have been helpful for your models to make sense of things. If you would use the log of GDP instead of GDP as your base value, okay? That might have been able you to distinguish between the median country then is going to have be closer to the middle of this value than what you see here. Okay? Any questions? Okay, good. Okay. Um, what I wanted to do and, um, is with the time I have, I'd like to talk about some more advanced ranking techniques. Okay? So it should be clear by now that yes, Computing grades is a good thing. We can do linear weights of things, and it maybe pays to normalize variables before doing it, and so stuff like, so, and stuff like that. Okay, but there's some other advanced alg algorithms people use for ranking that are kind of interesting, and I'd like to go through at least one of them today. Um, so let's look at um, this notion of ELO rankings. Okay, which is another way of computing scores for things. Okay, from data. And um, in the data that we're going to work with in this ranking problem and many other ranking problems is what we would call binary comparisons. In a lot of things in the world, people, you, know, you, you have data of the form. For these two things, there is a judgment that A is better than B. What might be an example of this? If you're looking at sports data about teams, if team A beats team B when they play each other, that is a vote that team A is better than team B. Does everybody see that? If we have, um, you know, on November something, this election, there's going to be people char charged with, each voter is charged with, should I vote for Hillary Clinton or should I vote for Donald Trump? Okay? And they're going to make a vote, and that's going to be a judgment that they think that in presidential betterness, the one I'm voting for is better than the other one. So if I want to come up with a score of presidential betterness, these votes are, give me something. Okay? Sometimes there are implicit votes that one thing is better than something else, which may not be explicit. Okay? So if we want to try to figure out whether University A is better than University B, we could see how many times were there students that were accepted to University A and University B and chose A over B, right? If all of you guys were accepted to MIT and accepted to Stony Brook and all of you guys chose to go to Stony Brook, that would be a vote that Stony Brook was better than MIT. Does everybody see that? So what I want to claim is that there's a lot of data where there are you get data that can be interpreted either explicitly or implicitly as a votes of given pairs of objects, which is better than the other one. Any questions about that? Okay. So how would you then use vote data to try to figure out who is the better to rank objects? Let's say we had a bunch of sports teams and we wanted to figure out the best who was the best team, okay? We could maybe just take how many games did it play and how many times were, of the times that it played, 
How many times did it win? And the team with the most wins would be the best team, right? But does everybody see that if you just count votes, it, when you have multiple contenders here, it doesn't level the field when different people play different qualities of opposition, okay? Actually, I have a feeling I'm, I'm saying this more weakly than I should. Suppose we have a universe where there's, there's, you know, there's 350 college football teams, okay? And Stony Brook's going to play Sacred Heart, and Stony Brook lost to Sacred Heart, okay? So that was a vote that Sacred Heart be, is, is a better place than Stony Brook, at least in college football, right? You could imagine having all of these, you know, comparing. Every game is going to be between two teams. It's a vote. We could say that the team that won the most games is the best team, right? But does everybody see that that does not pick up some differences, like the differences in competition, okay? If you played, if you had one team that was playing very, very good schools, okay, and it won half of its games, it is a very good school, right? Stony Brook in football only plays lousy schools. If Stony Brook had won all 11 of its games this year in football, compare it to a team in the Big Ten that lost, won three games and lost eight. Which is the better team? The Big A team, the Big Ten team, trust me, okay? And the question is, does everybody see that just counting votes fails to work when all the votes don't cover the same conditions? Any questions about that? Okay, fair enough. So there is a system called ELO rankings that, has been, that, that, that is used in originally in chess scoring and in other, a lot of other things to try to adjust rankings based on new paired comparisons. Okay? And the idea for this system is that every entity in the system, every chess player, every team, every whatever, has a current score. And after the, they're going to pay, if every match that they're involved with, we're going to adjust their score up or down depending upon the results of the match. Okay? So the basic rate, rating adjustment formula is suppose I start out with a ranking R of A, if I'm player A. Uh, I play a game, I'm going to go play another person B. We're going to reflect my outcome in the match as either going from minus 1 to 1. Minus 1 meant I lost. 1 meant I won. Maybe 0 means a tie. Does everybody see that my outcome here can be encoded by a number from minus 1 to 1, right? Mu of A is going to be what was the expected outcome of the match based on our skill level. If I could predict what was likely to happen in the match, okay, the question really is not whether I won or lost, but how surprising is it, my performance? If I was going to be competing against a good football, Stony Brook goes and plays against a, the best college football team in the world, what's going to happen? Stony Brook will get killed, okay? Now, does that mean that Stony Brook's worse than we thought it was? No, okay? Now, suppose, due to a miracle, Stony Brook actually beat this team. Suddenly, Stony Brook's score ranking should go up. It shouldn't lose very much for losing to a great team, right? Does everybody see that? It should gain a lot, it should lose a lot for losing to a lousy team, okay? And so basically what the way it's adjusting the score is what was the outcome minus the expected outcome. And there is some parameter k here that modulates how much do we react in terms of this last game. What's the maximum amount we're going to react to it, right? Okay. Any questions about that? Does everybody see how in principle this can give you a scoring system? Yes. So what will we start with? We're going to give each team initially probably the same score, okay? So probably the right way to do it is originally every team has the same score, okay? And then we adjust points 
based on this. And as the system goes by, the better teams will take points from the weaker teams. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. What? K is going to be how much am I willing to allow the rankings to change in response to one match? Okay? If, let's say, that, that anything that happened in the past was irrelevant, then I, K should be extremely large. If all that matters is what I did in my last game. Okay? But generally speaking, you can imagine a parameter where if you want scores to react quickly to changes, you would have a large K. If you want it to be slowly reacting to changes, you would want a, a low K. Okay? Any questions? How do you count? So what's the interesting thing? Right now we're going to say K, we're going to say you pick one based on how much swinging you want. You don't want typically a scoring system to be psychotic and suddenly vary wildly in response to every match, right? But the question really is how do you predict what the prediction is, okay? What is the expected amount, uh, 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 the expected outcome for a match? And it should be that if we could estimate what the probability is that A beats B, then what is the expected outcome of a match, that's then well defined. What's the, what's the value of the match for A? I get a 1 if the probability, of, uh, 1 times the, the expected value for me, if, if either I win or I lose, it's 1 times the probability I win plus minus 1 times the probability I lose. Everybody get that idea? So I claim that that scoring function reduces to what is the probability that A is going to beat B. If I know how to do that, I can compute the expectation. Any questions? And if I want my scoring function to be meaningful, I would like this probability that A beats B to be a function of the scores that I have. Right? I'm trying to predict the, come up with scores for how good is the school. Let's say I wanted to rank universities, okay? I'd like to know if a student has accepted the both, what's the likelihood they're going to pick me or you, okay? And I would like it to be a function of the rankings that I have. If my rankings are meaningful, the probability they go to the higher ranked school is, should, should be greater. And it should increase the more the ranks are different, okay? Any questions about that? That should kind of make sense. So in particular, we'd like this probability of A winning to be a function of the difference between the rank of A and the rank of B. Any questions? If rank, if students, if A and B are of the same skill, what's the probability that A should win? Okay, if A and B are of the same skill, what's the likelihood A should win? One half. Does everybody agree? And it could go between 0 and 1. OK. So we need a function that, given a parameter x, which represents the difference in observed skill, OK, produces a probability on it. Right? If my ranking is 17 and your ranking is 23, what is the probability you're going to beat me? Okay? And I claim that a good function for doing it is something we will see a lot of this semester, something called the logit function. The logit function, which is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z, is a function that as z goes, z is 0. What is e to the 0? 1 over 1 plus 1 is 1 half. So if the difference in scores is 0, the probability of A winning is 1 half, right? Suppose A is wildly bigger than B, and Z is very, very big. If Z is enormous, what is E, oh, what is e to the minus enormous? That's 1 over E to the enormous, which is 0. The probability of this goes to 1 as Z goes to infinity. Does everybody see that? And if z is minus infinity, let's say that z is you know, negative infinity, okay? 
The other guy is so much better than me. What's the chances of me winning? E to the minus minus infinity is infinity, right? 1 over infinity is 0. Does everybody see that? So this function has the phenomena we want. It produces a probability as a function of score. And if our score is a difference of two scores, okay, the bigger the difference, the chain difference the probability is. And that now completely defines the ELO method. Does everybody kind of get that idea? Okay. Any questions about it? There's an example I worked out in, again, ELO is famous for its chess rankings. Does anyone know what ELO stands for? Okay, it stands for this guy's name. It was his name. It's not an abbreviation. Okay? 